Welcome to Commissioner's Corner. I'm Commissioner Charlotte Garrido, and today we're going to talk about a community concern that can be observed in many of our public spaces, on our streets, in our parks, on our public trails, um, near our local businesses. It knows no boundaries, so it's in the rural areas and in the cities, in our neighborhoods. Today we're discussing homelessness in Kitsap County. My hope is that we're going to review many of the situations that people find themselves in of having no reliable place to live. That means no place to sleep, to prepare meals, to shower, to wash. We want to do a special focus on some of the opportunities and some of the um, affordable and available opportunities for housing in Kitsap County. I am joined today by quite some wonderful people who are doing some of that great work here in Kitsap County. Tim Blair is the pastor of Ecclesia Church and also affiliated with Project Share in Kitsap County, in South Kitsap County, by That's the way. Right. Sarah Van Cleve is um, the chair of the Housing and Homeless Coalition. She also is the housing director for Bremerton Housing Authority. Mm -hmm. Kurt Wiest is the executive director for the Bremerton Housing Authority. And Nancy Olston is the um, outreach director for Kitsap Rescue Mission. Thank you all for being here today. I'm really looking forward to our discussion. Thank you. And while we're talking about a very important topic, uh, we have about 25 minutes, which is not nearly the time we need. But we hope to get some important issues out for discussion. So having no home, who are the unhoused in Kitsap County is really the question. Um, the numbers have risen significantly since about 1990 and, and then dreadfully during the, our economic downturn. It's primarily due to the rising costs and availability of truly affordable housing. We understand that about one in every 150 citizens who live in Kitsap County are homeless. One in every 150. Every one of those individuals and families has a story. You know, there's their wives, husbands, daughters, sons, brothers, sisters. They're people we know. And so understanding their dilemma and our dilemma helps lead us to solutions. I guess one of the questions immediately that people ask me is, what leads someone to homelessness? I know losing a job, a divorce, domestic violence are some of the, the easy answers. What, what are some of the things that you're seeing out there in the community? Kurt, well, I think um, there's a whole host of reasons that someone can find themselves without housing. And it, and it, it goes across all income um, levels, too. We find that uh, in this community now, there is a, a, a high demand for housing. We have a housing shortage. For those that have the lowest economic resources, they're the ones that are squeezed the most. They're, we're seeing escalating rents, and we're not seeing an increase in the number of available housing units for them. Mm -hmm. And so those individuals that have the least amount of economic resources are the ones that are squeezed out the most. Tell me about escalating rents. What kinds of prices are we looking at today, in well, 2018? I think one of the, the figures that I've, I use and have seen is that we've seen a 30% increase in the rental, um, rental prices over the last two years. 30% in two years. In two years. Mm -hmm. and Ouch. It, and it shows no sign of slowing down. Um, I think as we've come out of the Great Recession, we've also seen some economic boost in the Seattle metro area. And people are looking for areas of affordability, and they're casting their eyes towards Kitsap County. Because we're an easy commute away mm -hmm. if, if they happen to work there. Well, let's, let's move to the, the Homes for All discussion because it is, it, it is bringing together a, a lot of, of folks in Kitsap County to talk about what possible solutions um, could exist. This is a, an organization that came out of um, a forum that we had in June of 2016 
where we brought together a whole lot of people to talk about um, what is the problem and what are some potential solutions. Um, the League of Women Voter helped facilitate discussions and uh, we came out of the, at the end of the day, actually having a couple of speakers. Um, we had uh, Andy Heben who wrote this book, 10 City Urbanism. We had Lloyd Pendleton who is from Utah. Uh, where they have a, a very successful model of housing first. And it was a really um, rejuvenating day because we discovered that there are many people in, in this county who have good ideas and good capacities. And we have continued to meet ever since then. We meet monthly and um, we have a, at least 25 people at most meeting, representing uh, 25 different organizations at each of the meetings. So um, there's civic organizations, there are health care, there's social service providers, philanthropy, education, um, housing agencies. Uh, Kitsap County has three or four different departments that attend, and the tribes, to be just to name a few of the many um, represented uh, agencies that come to talk about solutions. Uh, we've had some really good ideas, um, but one of the, the ideas seems to um, be that um, maybe boarding houses and tiny houses are a solution. But I think maybe to just lay a little bit more of a framework, we actually have a plan in Kitsap County for homelessness mm -hmm. housing, for housing those who have no home. And Sarah, would you tell us just briefly what the sure. goals are and some of the, the understanding of what's available? So we do have a homeless housing plan and you can find it on the um, Kitsap County website. And it just describes all of the elements. I like to think about it as like a big toolbox. Um, and what tools can Kitsap County put in their toolbox to um, close the gap for people um, dealing with homelessness. Um, so we kind of have a tagline, if you will. It says to make homeless rare, brief, and one time. So, Say that again. Okay. <laughs> um, make homelessness rare, brief, and one time. So when you think about making it rare, when a um, family or an individual ends up in homelessness, how do we make that opportunity, if you will, in their life um, rare. So that would be um, looking at how we discharge people from institutions, whether it's a mental health institution or jail. A number of them are um, discharged into homelessness. So how do we, we bridge that gap? Um, we just talked about rent burden. How do we keep families that are, that are rent burdened from losing their home um, due to economic um, difficulties. One of the things that has come out in the homeless housing plan is the number of people that um, are forced into homelessness due to medical issues. Either they're mentally ill or they have chronic medical issues and they can't, you know, if you have to choose between taking your medicine or paying your rent, ultimate. Or having your surgery. Or having your surgery, your surgery, exactly. So that's how we deal with rare. Brief, we look at how quickly somebody who is in homelessness re-enters being housed, whether it goes from a shelter to transitional housing to permanent housing, and how do we bridge that gap? And then um, the one time, pretty self-explanatory, how do we make sure it never happens again? So going back to people that suffer from maybe mental illness or chemical dependency, how do we, through supportive services, once we get them stable, keep them stable? So that's what the housing, um, the homeless housing plan does. And it, it's full of statistics. Um, we, um, as part of the um, Housing and Homeless Coalition, um, we work on creating data for um, the community so that we can access funds based on, on the level of homelessness that we have. And that's one of the things that the, our group does. So one of the things you have is a graph. Uh, it, it really attracts my attention that just lists the kinds of housing that are available yeah. and um, where we actually have adequate or enough uh, housing of that style or right. type and where we don't ha sometimes have any. Exactly. Um, but it's, it's pretty dramatic. Where do you find some of the, um, the biggest um, zeros? We have, we have no tent city which I know a lot of people don't know that that see that as a solution 
but it's a tool and it does create shelter for um, families that would otherwise you know sleep in their cars or or what have you and um, we do not have any tiny home villages um, and um, respite shelter so respite shelter is um, when a person is discharged from the hospital and um, maybe they have ongoing antibiotics that they need to take or they have medication that they need to take that needs to be refrigerated and we put them out in home, into homelessness, they have no way to, to maintain their meds or monitor their meds. So then they end up sicker and it just becomes this kind of revolving um, cycle. And so if you have respite care, a person can be discharged because maybe they don't need skilled nursing anymore but they need a place to rehab um, and we do have rehab places, don't get me wrong, but this is a different kind of rehab. Um, we don't have any respite beds. Fortunately, it's not, I mean, we've looked at it and we don't need a ton of beds t to fill that. So we, we like to think of that goal as kind of low-hanging fruit. If we could get a few respite beds, it would make a huge difference and it would close that gap. I just think very quietly of those who have had surgery or, mm -hmm. or still do need their meds and have no respite care yeah. and are living outside. So even the ability to be able to timely take their meds, mm -hmm. it, it's unfathomable. Yeah, and to pay attention to their medical issues while they're in crisis mm -hmm. because they're homeless. So while we're looking at this matrix again, um, across the top, it talks about the different populations that are in seeking um, housing. Which uh, populations may need the most attention? Probably the people that have no income. Oh, well, yes. <laughs> yeah. So I know it's, it's hard to wrap your head around that somebody actually has no income, but there are many people out there that aren't eligible for um, any kind of funding source. And plus, funding sources are dwindling, so they, you know, like um, welfare, TANF. Now it's a HEN program where they get just a little bit of money. Um, so I would have to say that is um, one of the largest populations because they don't really have any options. Nobody's going to rent to you for free. That sounds like a, actually a topic that we should explore in much more depth because no income is um, pretty constricting. Or it, you... It, well, it's a, there's a, a downward cycle, a spiral that one can find themselves in when you lose uh, stable housing, uh, then it becomes that much more difficult to maintain the other areas of your life, such as finding employment, maintaining employment, uh, taking care of yourself, wellness, for those that have uh, health concerns and, and are struggling with um, uh, health issues, be able to medicate, and as, as we've talked about, uh, manage their health. All of those things get in this downward spiral that is almost impossible to reverse unless you have housing stability. And then you have that base, then you can reverse that cycle and start moving forward. But trying to go out and, and find employment when you have no address to share with an employer, it, it, it's just a very difficult uh, hole to, to climb out of. Wow. Well, let's talk, let's actually talk about reversing that cycle. <laughs> so we have been uh, talking about um, creating new forms of housing, introducing forms of housing that don't currently exist and allowing them uh, within different jurisdictions. The tiny houses, the boarding houses are uh, two models that came out of the, the workshop and uh, we've already got some tiny houses built. Would you like to tell us a little bit about what they are and um, how they're situ going to be situated on the landscape? Well, it's exciting. Um I just began to be part of the Homes for All Committee in March of last year. And the idea of tiny houses has been exciting. We've talked about it, but it seems to be a movement going across America. And we do have 11 built right now. The design we actually borrowed from the Low Income Housing Institute, which is the organization that oversees the tiny house villages in Seattle. And we've looked at Eugene and the Opportunity Village and their design. So we have 11 now. And so just putting the word out to community, the, the businesses, the organizations, the support, uh, service organizations, churches, and we have 11 built, one on the way from the South Kitsap High School. They're going to build their second one. It's almost underway. 
so I visited there last uh, last week. Right. But uh, they're easy to build, and so if, if people want to know about it, we have the designs. We can send out emails of the PDF, the designs. Are only about two thousand dollars to build one tiny house, and with all of that. This design is simple, it's easy to build. Individuals, I have requests and emails right now I need to respond to from couples and uh, families who have asked, I'd like to build one, and so uh, how do I do it? Where do I get the designs, and, and, and how much is it going to cost? And so United Way is handling all of the funding and all of the donations, and they have, they're helping uh, funnel the money to people that need it, and so the high school is building them, and I could say a lot more. But what do you want to know specifically? Well, I think telling us a little bit about how large they are, right. and and um, they don't each have a kitchen That's and right. a bathroom. They that is a shared facility or shared right. facilities. Well, we're looking at the design that Seattle has followed, or King County, or in Oregon, and so we we look at a village concept that has these tiny houses, we're calling them cottages in Kitsap County, and so they are basically bedrooms that are eight foot by twelve foot structures that are simple. Some people would call them sheds, but they're basically going to be like a bedroom with uh, two windows. So we've found that having two windows as a cross breeze is really good. And they're easy to build, and so they're mobile. They're not going to be on wheels. They're going to be on some type of structure, uh, foundation that's wood that we can move them around. And we have towing companies that have offered to do it for free, like Leo's Towing in South Kitsap. And so we're going to have a central building that's sort of the facility that provides the kitchen facility and the bath and shower facilities. So all of the personal needs will be not within the tiny house, but the central facility buildings that we're going to be put, placing in the middle of the village. And so, and so you talk about towing them. That's because these are temporary villages. Right. Um, and we expect, uh, we, we observe from mm -hmm having looked at Eugene mm -hmm. or Olympia That's or right. Seattle yeah. villages, that people would need about two years sometimes mm -hmm. for them to be able to work on the issues that are have, they're facing and find themselves to, uh, going towards self-sufficiency. Right. And, and then we would probably relocate that village so that mm -hmm. um, we, we could be using other properties. It's very mobile, very mm -hmm. easy to place, and, and it's really, it's, it's a very, very simple way and cheap way to help people in our community. For maybe fifty to $80,000, we could probably put a whole village together Amazing. with 12 to 14 houses. Amazing. Thank you. Um, so, building and creating those those structures has been a phenomenal achievement. The easier part, actually. <laughs> yeah. uh, but has has brought together a lot of different folks, mm -hmm. and especially the churches mm -hmm. in South Kitsap have been amazing at um, devoting days and, and materials to, to have that happen. But a second part of the equation is the support services that are necessary for the individuals and, and families who will be li living in the villages. Nancy, would, you're the outreach director for the rescue mission and have um, some really nice experience at putting together this support system. Would you like to talk a little bit about what kind of work you would be doing with those residents? Sure. Well, one of the things that we want to um, to look at for them is, is self-governance, is a self-governance model. And this is great at restoring their, their confidence and giving them skills to uh, negotiate with one another, to problem solve. And, um, and, and to make choices with their lives. So it's putting choice back into their lives, which is something that you don't, you don't have when you're homeless. Uh, so we would be bringing, uh, helping them do that self-governance piece, put that together, provide some guidance. There would probably be, a, we're still looking at the structure of, of a board or oversight uh, committee from agencies in the community. And, but then the, but the residents themselves would, would be in charge of, um, you know, the day-to-day the -day processes and problem solving that's in there. We would be bringing uh, services on site from, from the local agencies, such as case management, bringing in housing solutions for housing. Uh, Peninsula Community Health is offered to come on site for health issues, uh, kids at mental health for mental health problems. One of the things that's been so amazing, um, especially like at your meetings, is to sit there at a table with all of these providers who are focused on the same thing and working together uh, to make that happen. And so I think that's one of the things, we have an amazing community with that. So yes. I think that's one of the really positive things to um, going for this uh, that would make it work is, is, that, is that potential. So. so the model that I see in Seattle, for example, when you're talking of self-governance, it's really about 
assuming responsibility. And so because you're going to be doing most of this direct work, um, what I saw is, and, and talked to the residents there about, was that they actually have, they self-elect within the village three different positions from residents. One is the person who manages security, so that there will be a, a security check-in uh, at the front of the village. Anybody coming and going um, checks in there, um, and especially guests must sign in and sign out. Um, and not everyone is welcome because it's, there's there's needs to be some real calming and um, uh, responsibility of the residents. So they are learning to maintain the, the facilities, their own space, yes. and the shared spaces themselves. Um, so the, the security check-in is one very important role that, that will be played by um, somebody who's what it was elected in Seattle and I think it's a good idea the second is kitchen management you know making sure that the, the kitchen is maintained in good shape and um, that people have the the um, materials that they need to be able to create meals uh, in that space interestingly the third elected uh, role there is an arbitrator so that when there are disagreements or major dilemmas uh, within the village, that the arbitrator helps to mediate. And um, the, the fellow I met at Othello Village actually said that he'd be happy when we get something going in Kitsap to be able to come over and, and spend time with uh, and even live there for a, f a few weeks just to be able to introduce the idea to residents here. Um, because we haven't talked about that before, I wonder what you think of, of those three elected positions as, as something that helps the residents to become self-governing and self-responsible. Because every individual is supposed to be, have some responsibility, but to, um, to begin to, to govern themselves literally, what do you think? No, I think it's terrific because um one of the things you lose when you're homeless is that sense of agency or that you can make a difference. And this puts that back in their hands with a structure that, um, you're right, addresses the everyday needs of their life in that in the village. Um, and I forgot to mention as a partner for security was the sheriff's department who's offered to do the training and create a training program for the security there. Oh, that's great. Um, actually, the sheriff has been um, a, a wealth of information on this too. What a, what a great group of folks we've got working on this. Nancy, is there anything else you wanted to say about working directly with the residents? Oh, just that, that when I've done this in the past, we haven't had a community to work with like that, but, but um, I've gotten together groups of the homeless who come to the rescue mission and want to do be involved in something with the community, taught them how to run meetings and uh, to rotate leadership and things like that. And that's just been a real empowering thing for them to find their voice um, and to be able to have a choice in what happens with them. And, and so they're having choices, they're working to have quality within their own community, and they're actually helping clean up the, the surrounding area so that they are taking pride in their own in their new neighborhood as well as within their own village, which I think is just quite wonderful. So. A theme I've kind of heard running through what we're doing uh, in Homes for All is community building. I've observed within the faith community in South Kitsap the community building uh, around creating these structures. Oh, it's it's yeah. So many organizations, Kaiser Permanente, Habitat for Humanity, you know, United Way, churches, service clubs, all of them, any neighborhood that has a village placed in it will be benefited by this. It, it will be a, a blessing to their community. So we've got the builders, the, right. the faith community. <laughs> we've got actually Homes for All has become a really amazing organization and, and um, the taskmaster in me helps us understand mm -hmm. that we've got the physical structure but we've also got the human element uh, within the village and within the larger community. And I have really seen some quite amazing evolution through this process of us as 
as a group, as of community members who share information, share capacities, and create possibilities. And I wonder what you're thinking about well, that. I, I think it's a recognition that this community sees that we have a housing crisis that we're in. It is affecting everyone. Whether somebody has stable housing or not, they know someone, a son, a daughter, a friend, who has struggled with maintaining stable housing. And this community is, I think, rising up. And all of these groups that Tim has cited, people are saying, we can do better than this. What? And then the next question they ask is, what can I do, uh, either as an individual or as a group? I, I, I couldn't, I mean, absolutely fabulous conclusion. Sarah, what are you seeing? Um, I think the um, concept of supportive services um, kind of was popular you know, a couple decades ago and kind of went away because people wanted to have choices and they didn't want to have people in their lives and they could handle it. So I'm glad that that's come back because I think that that's, um, especially with the tiny house village, you know, once we get our village and we move people in and we provide those supports, um, people will engage and then um, deal with the barriers that got them into homelessness in the first place. And that once you get that going, then, then you can, you know, strive to end homelessness. Yeah. And, and we'll have all the resources in our toolbox. So um, once we get our tiny village, that's just another great tool that we have. So I'm anxious and I'm, I'm pleased with the number of agencies that are looking at ways um, within their own agencies to provide supportive services and then agencies that are stepping up to say, we will provide services for those families so that we don't, not just sticking them in a home and saying, okay, you're housed, yeah. carry on. Yeah. Yeah. But we're actually finding that community partnership and sense of neighborhood mm -hmm. writ large through this process. Even the idea of creating a village, we've had an architect, an engineer, you know, agencies and professionals stepping forward and volunteering their time to help us lay out this village physically and a other agencies about how we're going to help those who, who are living there to s achieve success, but actually helping us all achieve success right. as community partners and neighbors across Kitsap, whether we have a comfortable home or whether we're helping somebody to find um, an affordable and decent form of housing. Yeah, and the children. Getting, you know, so that we don't have children in our county living um, unsheltered. Yes, you know, yes, they need a, yes. a, a safe place and a stable place so that they can grow up and, and, you know, break the chain of poverty, if you will. If they don't have the opportunities, history will just repeat itself. When we all do better, we all do better. That's, That's right. right. Yes. So, so we all have a piece to play. I can't tell you how much I appreciate each of you mm -hmm. being here today and the work that you and many of us are doing throughout this county in addressing this significant dilemma. Um, For you leading it, too. Thank we're you. We're all <laughs> leaders. We're, we're all making a difference. So thank Sorry. you. Thank you for being with us today. Um, we'd like to continue this conversation. There's so much more to be said.